Yes. So if you're tuning in, my name is Liliana and I am part of the Amazon conservation team. Uh, welcome to our first Facebook Live interview. Today we're joined by award-winning journalist Adam Piori, and who is a former editor and correspondent for Newsweek magazine. His work has appeared in Scientific American, Discover Magazine, GQ, Business Week, and many others. Adam traveled with us to the Curare los Ingleses Indigenous Reserve, which is uh, deep in the Colombian Amazon. He wanted to see how local indigenous communities are working to protect their isolated neighbors. And um, you can read his fascinating account uh, on this trip on uh, February's Scientific Americans uh, uh, issue. And so that's the cover. And this is um, the story, Guardians of the Tiger People. There you go. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome. Um, and then actually, I also want to introduce uh, Daniel Aristizabal. He is a Colombian national. He's joining us uh, from Bogota. Uh, Daniel has a bachelor's degree in social and sociology from uh, York University and a master's degree in sustainable development studies from Erasmus University, Rotterdam. He has worked in the Amazon since 2008. Uh, when he arrived as a volunteer to work with indigenous communities and conservation. Since then, he has worked for the National Park Service in Colombia, the Office of Indigenous Affairs of the Ministry of the Interior in Colombia, and ACT, leading the efforts to protect isolated peoples of the country, both in the field and in the negotiations leading to the signature of a national policy for their protection in 2018. Thank you, Adam and Danny and Danny and Daniel for joining us. Um, how are you doing? Good. Hello, good. <laughs> Excited to be here. Uh, it's sunny down here in Colombia. I hope it's the same over there. It's not so much in DC, but uh -huh. we're happy for you. <laughs> okay, Danny, I thought that it would be a good uh, point to start for us. Um, if you could tell us what exactly an uncontacted uh, community, yes. And perhaps what are some of the biggest misconceptions that we hold of them here? Well, the first thing is most people, most anthropologists and local communities here refer to them more as isolated people than uncontacted, precisely because uh, they live in very remote areas and most of them have had contact in the past. So these are communities that live deep in the forest that uh, shun all contact away from outsiders. They um, avoid contact at all costs from anybody, including other indigenous people, or also sometimes even including their own clans or family members. So these are people who decide to take refuge in the deep, deep in the forest and avoid absolute contact with anybody. They might have short-term sporadic contacts that they meet people in trails or in hunting grounds and then they flee. So that doesn't mean that that breaks their isolation or their uncontactedness. It just means that they don't want contact at all. So they'll always keep hiding deep in the forest and sometimes they'll react violently also when approached upon. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so, um, Adam, we wanted to know, uh, we were curious uh, to know what motivated you to write an article on the isolated peoples uh, in the Amazon? Um, well, I don't know, I just, you know, it's just a topic I've always been fascinated with, people living totally, I mean, I guess I had sort of a romantic idea, people living sort of uncorrupted by modern civilization. And uh, I just, you know, and, and living off the land, uh, it just was a fascinating idea to me. Uh, people were still living as people have been living since humanity was born. But, um, but also there's, you know, interesting political issues. Um, you know, uh, I, I had been to the Amazon previously in Brazil not writing about isolated people, but just about indigenous tribes who lived in the Shingu National Park trying to protect the land. So um, I just think the issue of the Amazon, it's so important for uh, the health of the planet with, with global warming. And, uh, and these are the, the sort of the stores of the Amazon. Um, so I don't know, I just thought it was fascinating. Also, I or, originally, I thought it was fascinating that uh, what originally attracted me to the story was that you guys were using the most sophisticated technology in the world, satellite technology that, that is at a resolution where you can basically you know, see the surface of banana leaves. 
and you're using the most sophisticated technology to protect, see what's going on around the territory of people living in the most primitive conditions. I thought that was just a fascinating idea. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And do you find with your trip that you had maybe some preconceived uh, perceptions of isolated peoples and the local indigenous communities? And did any, if so, did any of them change after your visit? Well, I thought what was particularly interesting to me was was sort of that the people uh, who lived in the surrounding um, areas uh, had had full contact with modernity. And obviously, they were dressed, you know, wearing uh, soccer shorts and T-shirts. One shaman had a shirt on that said uh, rock star. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and they and they went to, to the city. Some even went to Bogota for uh medical care and stuff and they've been exposed to television popular culture yet they still managed to maintain their spiritual beliefs and what was i just found fascinating was that um the relationship they had with their um you know the the, the tribes people that they were protecting you know mm -hmm. uh that they believed that um uh and and i know that act has done a lot of work and this is something that danny definitely emphasized to protect their cultural tradition so i thought it was uh and, you know, um, you know, in, in terms of getting shamans to bless the land and, and see what's safe and stuff. So I thought it was interesting that they believe that, um, you know, they're isolated neighbors who don't have access to, you know, televisions and computers and stuff were actually much more powerful that they're shamans because they were living in, in more, a more traditional pure state with nature could actually control the weather, you know, and then so that, that was the most that they had believed in the supernatural powers of their tribal neighbors and wanted to protect them. So I was particularly interested in the relationship between the, the two tribes and, and um, also um, just, you know, how life changes once you know, have had contact and how they think about those traditions. So that, that was all interesting and, and uh, yeah. Right. Oh, well, that's very interesting. Danny, can you maybe say more about how the communities uh, that are helping protect the their isolated neighbors, how they communicate with them in the way that they believe that they communicate with them. Can you speak to that relationship that they have? Yeah, well, what Adam was talking about, how, about how we use uh, 21st century technology, like satellite imagery and cartography and GPS technology and all that, that's kind of our tools, but they have their own tools, the communities. And then the challenge is to mix those tools, the traditional spiritual tools of protection with this modern age technology. So they're open to discussing with us the use of these images, the use of these maps to help them plan their trips, their patrols, their uh, um, when they patrol the territory. But at the same time, they're the tools that they most value and cherish are the traditional ways of living in the forest, which they, I agree with Adam, they see kind of a nostalgia in the isolated people. So there's kind of a thing in that they need to protect them because they have what they lost, right? And the little bit that they still have, these contacted communities is a bit of a, the shaman's knowledge and power. So what they do is that they have through stories in, of, their, of their origins, through their like myths, the stories of creation, they believe that they know um, that every tribe in a specific territory has a specific place and that must be respected. Um, and then the tribes of this area of the Amazon, they are tribes that connect spiritually through the coca plant and the tobacco. And through these plants, they manage to establish a sort of telepathic, sort of shamanic communication that is obviously invisible and metaphysical and transcendent from our understanding. But um, so in a way, they kind of have a certain telepathy with other shamans. The more powerful you are, the bigger your antenna and the more you can communicate. Uh, so a normal shaman would be able and can communicate with other shamans around the forest. The thing that's interesting with isolated people is that they can perceive that there's another shaman there. But even the shaman in isolation tells them that they don't want to be bothered. So there's actually no dialogue. It's that they just perceive like a, kind of like a field force of some spiritual telepathy and the field force uh, tells them not to enter. So there's not actually a, an, an open dialogue with isolated people. It's more of a, of a barrier that they can perceive through spirituality. So 
we obviously respect that. And at the same time, we build on that. So we help the shamans get their word across to other people in the community to respect these, these barriers, these intangible areas that shouldn't be contacted. Uh, and that is done together with modern age technology when you put that on maps and help people patrol and decide what areas need to be protected and what areas don't. Right, and that's very interesting. So, Daniel, how does ACT work with the indigenous communities in practical ways? How is that technology used? What type of technology do we use to, to work in partnership with the local communities for the protection of the isolated uh, peoples? Well, <clears throat> what we do is uh, we try, um, first of all, they share their land with the isolated people. So the isolated people are on a national park, but also they move into the indigenous reserve, right? So um, this knowledge is known by the elders, but through, for example, uh, animated videos or uh, school textbooks that we design with the community, we try to take this knowledge up to like the children and the youth. So basically what is done in general terms is the community has a plan to protect their territory, which is basically a management plan, and we help implement that plan. So one of the one of the main activities to protect a forest in the Amazon when it's um, threatened by different activities, illegal activities mostly, is to establish a surveillance and control strategy. So this is we help them build cabins that they've strategically placed in the in the territory, uh, control posts, and then with the shaman's blessing, which is what Adam referenced, that's where we build them, and then the shaman kind of leads the way on how these control posts are operated, and then we have indigenous kind of like indigenous park guards that patrol these areas and live in these control posts and protect people from entering the territory of the isolated people. So what we do with these isolated park guards is that we train them in GPS technology. We train them to look at satellite imagery. We train them to make maps, to communicate through radios. Now they're starting to use computers to put all the data down that they're recording all that they do in their patrols so that we can have a solid database and a solid system of protection. This protection system is in constant dialogue with the National Park Service. So they also have cabins and patrol and control posts and patrols that are in sync and, and intertwined with the, with the patrols that the community does. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it is supporting the shaman's role in protection. So guiding these um, guards, these indigenous guards on how to do their job, giving them tips on how to do and um, sometimes even telling them when and when not to go and where to go because they can perceive through telepathy where the threats are and where the isolated people are. And then we wind that with educational programs in the communities and local schools so that the things that their elders do out in the field in the remote areas of the reserve is taught in the schools. Um, but then the reserve is not an island in itself. So what we do is we foster and help communities come to agreements with neighboring communities on how to use the resources around the territory where isolated people are. So they don't have to go inside the territory of isolated peoples, but only around it. So how to uh, agreements on how to fish, where to fish, how many species, where to cut trees, so that they don't affect the isolated people, but everybody can actually have and use the forest. So in terms of um, timber for their houses, fish, is fish for food, hunting grounds, even spiritual places that are off bounds or that are allowed to go. Uh, so that all creates a strategy of protection uh, for the isolated people. Great, thank you. Now, Adam, um, just following up on what we were just talking about, and because it would be really interesting to hear the perspective of someone who's been to, to these places for the first time, uh, what was the experience like to sit down with the community, and what do you, what do you perceive was their understanding of, of the isolated peoples uh, and spending time with them. It was great. It was fascinating. Uh, I, I just say, I just thought of one other reason that I find this story so fascinating. And then I'll go back to that, which is just that, you know, it seems like for years there has been rumors of these isolated peoples living in the jungle, but nobody knew for sure. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, Danny's uh, mentor and, and predecessor, Roberto Franco had been collecting scraps of information, right? Um, from, from drug traffickers, from uh, former rebels, people who had gone through the jungle and verifying them. And now, not just in this place, but in other areas, ACT is working to, to demonstrate that they're there so that they can be protected and have these rights, which they just won support for. And so, so it was interesting to go 
see this pilot project the first place where it's actually happening. But just the idea that there have been these sort of ghosts that nobody sure exists was fascinating to me. And so it was it was interesting talking to the people about, you know, how they knew they existed, the sort of interactions they'd had. Somebody had seen smoke one time. Somebody else like took money and went in illegally to their lands and then got freaked out because, you know, the p people were following them. And, you know, it's just like a, a dramatic movie. Um, but sorry, I, now I forgot the question because I just went off on a tangent. So what the question was, what was the question? Yeah, no problem. Well, it, it, it seems interesting for us to find out when you had the opportunity to sit down with members of the community, um, you know, how they felt about their brothers and sisters who are in isolation. And um, I think there is not a well-known fact that they are actively participating in the protection of these communities. Uh, I think that's what's really um, interesting about the story. Uh, how much they care about the well-being of these communities um, I mean, and how connected they are. It's fascinating to me just, again, the, the fact that, you know, especially being living in a city, we tend to romanticize nature and, and what it's like in the jungle. And, and um, so it's interesting to see how people who have the opportunity to straddle both worlds think about it. And, you know, just that they value their, you know, their, their uh, isolated cousins and, and want to protect that so just to talk to them about why it was important and meaningful for them and to talk to them about um, their own traditions and 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 how important those traditions are to them you know their identity and why they want to protect them and then also you know it, like i said it has implications for i was interested in how they perceive the forest and the jungle around them which uh you know is important for everybody um so uh, sitting down with them, I, I don't know. I just found, found it fascinating, especially the um, especially the shamans. You know, there was one guy in particular, an elderly shaman, they uh, they from upriver, the guy who was wearing the rock star T-shirt, and uh, and they brought him in because um, there had been this series of calamities had befallen the community, I guess, right? So there was one guard who had uh, gotten mysteriously sick and died, and they didn't know why, and so they believed that. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it was because they were out of balance with their environment. So they got this elderly rock star shaman to come and they hired him. And so it was interesting to talk to him about how he went about restoring the balance of nature, you know, and uh, yeah, just the, the whole, I mean, and, and, and uh, you know, they, they believe sometimes that when they talk about the, their isolated neighbors, sometimes there's thunder and rain and that that's a message from the shamans. And, um, and it was just kind of spectacular to be out there in this, the, the place where we were, like the people who were hosting, right? Like one of the guy's brothers got drunk and went to the river a, a month before and never came back because he was eaten by a crocodile, you know? And, and so just the force of nature there, you know, the vastness of the river, I saw pink dolphins uh, frolicking and, and, uh, and, and it's just a powerful uh, place, you know, the Amazon. So to see how that has been integrated, you know, and how, how uh, people have come to understand the world living under those powerful forces, even as they have contact with the modern world, is just fascinating to me. Although I'm just, I'm also interested, it's just like a great story too, because you have all these interesting threats. You have drug dealers, you have um, rebels, you have uh, gold miners, you have loggers, and they're all converging. Or have the, and then you have crazy American missionaries trying to sneak in. And, uh, and, and so ACT is trying to shield the, these people who could be caught in the middle who are vulnerable because they could get sick or lose their culture. Right. So I just, it's just a fascinating story too. It is. To write about. Thank you. And th this leads me to my next question. Uh, Daniel, what are the threats that are, that are facing um, the uncontacted people, the isolated people? Um, well, actually, Adam pointed them out, you know, he, he really hit the nail there. Uh, basically, there's a big uh, interest now in the global. It's funny how these remote places connect to the global market, right? And it's kind of like we're in these remote areas where a lot of the big effects of uncontrolled capitalism are seen. Um, so definitely the world's uh, gold prices are creating another gold rush in the Amazon at the moment. So there's a lot of illegal mining, polluting the rivers uh, with mercury. 
um, that eventually gets accumulated by the fish and eaten by the people and it's very poisonous. In fact, we believe the people, the isolated people are poisoned by mercury at this point in time and they don't even know about it from people that are mining upriver or downriver, right? Because the fish kind of like the salmon in the US, they go upriver too. So one of the main threats at the moment is illegal mining. Another big threat is illegal logging. Some of these areas have very fine woods that are exported in the legal market. Some of them have been sold. A recent investigation that we are going to partner up with is showing that um, the, a lot of these illegal woods are actually sold in the Colombian market. Um, <clears throat> like Adam said, there's a, right now, many of you will know that Colombia in 2016 signed a peace accord with the FARC, with the rebel left-wing guerrilla army, uh, but some of the fractions that did not sign the peace accord are still in the forest, still active, and they need financing, and they finance themselves with drug dealing, with illegal mining, with extortion, with maybe illegal logging. We don't know that for a fact yet. So these are some of the threats that all combine into one. It's hard sometimes to separate one from the other because, um, are you guys hearing me? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, yeah, I think Chacha, we lost Chacha. Yeah. But um, so we've divided these, you know, these threats from illegal threats and formal and informal threats. Chacha, are you still there? I think we lost her. Adam, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I see her face, it's frozen in place. Oh, uh, I can see mine moving, but well, Not considering we're so many miles away from apparently. How many? On my screen, it says there's 18 viewers. Oh, oh cool. yeah, there, now you're bigger. Well, we can keep talking. Oh, I think so. Yeah, why, why not? Yeah, so anyway, so these are the threats. There's these all illegal threats, but there's these other informal threats, like you mentioned, like the missionaries, which you were right to say, um, they're pretty stubborn and pretty crazy. And Chacha's back. Uh, I, I am back. We were having technical difficulties. Yeah, we saw that, but we kept talking anyway. <laughs> good, good. So anyway, just to finish up with the threats issue, there's illegal threats, like I mentioned, and it's hard sometimes to separate one from the other, right? Illegal mining, illegal logging, drug trafficking, extortion. Sometimes even these really remote areas, uh, the rebel groups just hide there because it's really far for the army or anybody to come and follow them. But that's exactly where the isolated people are in the most remote areas. And then there's other informal threats. Um, so like I was, Adam was saying, you know, the missionaries trying to get there trying to convert their souls and uh, I, I guess save them from something that they don't, need be, they don't need to be saved. And there's also adventurers, tourists, explorers, anthropologists, a bunch of people actually are not interested in respecting and, and assuming that there's things in the world that we shouldn't know more of or that we shouldn't go. There's this spirit of exploration that is very Western, I think. Uh, that is very hard to combat because a lot of people still feel that, you know, the most remote places are the most attractive. And, and there's some places that are remote but just need to be left off, like these areas. So that's why you find uh, tourists or adventurers trying to get there and trying to see them, even anthropologists or linguists trying to contact them too. Right, and one of the dangers of contacting them is that they don't have the immune uh, systems to protect them from but diseases we might be carrying that we can control that we can manage here in this mm -hmm. part of the world uh in in colombia there's been in many different places but scores of people have died of of isolated people have died just from contact like wearing a jacket of from from someone else from the outside uh, it can it can it, it is a deadly contact mm -hmm. okay um, so one other thing that I wanted to to ask is uh, how is the situation in Colombia different uh, for isolated peoples or how much protection there is if you compare it to what's happening in Brazil and Peru? Mm, well, one of the important facts of the Colombian Amazon is that uh, it might not be as big as the Brazilian, but in some ways these areas are more protected. Uh, that is because the Colombians have developed a nation towards the mountains and towards the oceans. We have the Caribbean and the Pacific ports. So the roads, the cities, the settlements, uh, the big infrastructure is all in the mountains and the coast. And that's a bit different from Peru and Brazil, where especially Brazil, where all the development strategies 
go towards the forest, right? So big roads, highways trying to connect uh, the Andes with the Amazon, uh, big cities like Manaus, big hydro dams. Um, so Colombia doesn't have that. One reason is because that's the way the country has planned its development. But the other reason is also because of the ongoing conflict that has been going on for 50 years. So these places weren't attractive for neoliberal entrepreneurship, right? For big, big companies, big industry coming in to develop hydro dams or oil fields or roads or ports. When there's a conflict going on, there's no interest to develop because it's too risky. So now what we're seeing is an increasing deforestation now that the peace accord is over and then there's less illegal or dangerous actors in the field. Right, okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? I think would be that you would think is a, a great takeaway for those who are watching us right now, um, and who can maybe um, show their support, even though they were so far away. How can we support the efforts uh, that Daniel we have going ongoing in Colombia? Um, how can anyone support us? Wait, I have a suggestion. Oh yes. Yeah, please go ahead, because I don't. There, it was very awkward. I was there at the meeting. Oh, yeah. They, they like passed a resolution that Scientific Americans should buy them a new motor for, it, for their boat. <laughs> need a new motor. But I, yeah. I, I didn't have enough money and I was just a, a journalist there. But, but they, they said they wanted me to tell people that they need a motor for their boat, which will help them through ACT, which will help them patrol. But that's all I know. I mean, I could see that you guys were well. Anyway, sorry. That's <laughs> no, okay. no, so, Adam, did you did you have the opportunity to go and patrol some of the of, of the area with members of the community? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was fascinating. Um, just this idea, you know. And again, it's in in my story. I described it, and I was you know following Danny around and following him around. But they took me to the very edge of their territory and pointed to where they thought the tribesmen were, and then. Just, you know, um, and they have seen various things indicating people are close by. Mm -hmm. Right. So something that uh, reminds me of um, just the memory of when Adam visited is that, you know, we I talked about how we have these indigenous patrol guards, right? But they're chosen by the community in a democratic way, but they're also filtered by the shaman. So the shaman decides who goes and where and what. So, and he also decides if the patrols are done on foot or by boat or from the control post or if they're done deep in the forest and who does that. So Adam was very keen to come and visit and visit one of these patrols, right? So we jumped in on a boat that was patrolling and I think that's the cover of the, of the, of the article. Can you show right? it to us? Um, so he's like, I can't believe that's one of the patrol guards because this is, uh, these are the patrol guards, you know? Um, so you would imagine, you know, a young, fit guy with his machete and binoculars, but it, everybody in the community is participating on a rotating basis. So in this case, it was an elder woman who is actually one of the women that knows the best about the forest and the animals and can perceive clues and hints in the forest way better than anybody else. But it's a different type of patrolling that you would imagine. And when you think of, for example, African national parks, you have this image of these big guys trained by army officers patrolling with guns and and with camouflage suits but in this case it's it was a elder woman with her granddaughter and they are patrolling and they were the ones doing the report at the end of the day and then talking to the shamans about how the patrolling is done so that kind of goes to show a bit how the things are different here where the community has a lot more say into how things are done um so that was pretty cool and that's besides that's exactly why they felt empowered to ask Adam for a boat and a motor because they, you know, they're committed to doing this thing and they know that they need some resources and they see an opportunity and they take it. So they're not like passive informers, but they're active protectors of their territory, right? The, the engine will not only be to do the patrols, but it might also be used eventually to evacuate um, people who are sick or ill or move children around for different events in local schools and stuff like that. So. I think that was, and I can see how it's very uncomfortable because it's very intimidating being in one of these longhouses. Everybody with their cheeks full of coca, everybody with their shirts off, all these warriors around, and then pretty much demanding that things happen in their territory. 
So uh, I think Adam managed really well to explain what a journalist is because they have no idea really what a journalist does. Um, and um, yeah, so that was a funny story. One of the many stories that we shared from that, from that trip. Now to answer your question was about, I just think um, one thing we don't recognize, I think, and it's maybe not falling into a romanticism, but these are the last people that are resisting colonization in the world. And they have been the only people that have efficiently done it, I think. It doesn't mean that living in isolation is easy. That's another myth that has to be debunked. I'm sure it's really hard not to have neighbors, not to share. Um, it's actually ahistorical. All peoples in the world historically have shared with cultures, have shared, I mean, that's where language comes from, right? And culture, culture mutates. But they have faced so many threats and so many deaths in their history that they have decided to forego all that and still live in isolation. And they've managed to do it for hundreds of years. They've managed to resist colonization and capitalism and globalization and imposition of things that are not their own for hundreds of years. And they've effectively done that. Our estimates are that these populations are in fact even more healthy than the ones that have contact and have access to dentists and, and medicine and penicillin, et cetera. Uh, their numbers might even be more than neighboring tribes who have faced slavery and exploitation. So I think it's, something really important for all of us, even in this globalized and connected and modern world, to recognize that there's other ways completely different from our own on living in this world. Well, I, I think that's a beautiful way to, to close our interview. Thank you for reminding us about the significance of these populations. And thank you for sharing with us what you do in the field. And Adam, thank you so much for actually traveling to these remote places and, and help the rest of the world start to or begin to understand uh, the importance of this human rights issue, because uh, in the end, that's what uh, this is. Um, so thank you for sharing your time and experiences. And thank you for those of you who've uh, tuned in. We are going to uh, share a recording later on of this conversation. Um, just uh, remember that if you go to your local bookstore, um, there might be a copy of uh, Scientific it American. <laughs> and uh, because this article is really, really fascinating, um, Adam really does take you to this location and helps us understand the context of this story. Uh, so we strongly encourage you to, to read it. Uh, and um, if you want to learn more about our work in conservation and how we do it in partnership with indigenous communities uh, in Colombia, in Suriname, and Brazil, uh, please visit us online at www.amazonteam.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, and stay tuned because we plan on having uh, many more of these conversations so that you get to know more uh, members of our team. and. Uh, hopefully so that we get to know you better. So if you have any ideas, uh, suggestions on, on what we should do next uh, with our Facebook Live interviews, please let us know. So thank you so, so very much for being with us, uh, Adam and Danny, and uh, un abrazo a los dos, and uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Chacha, and thank you, Adam, for putting everything in writing. Uh, you really did an awesome job. We were very skeptical from literally a gringo writing about us. Uh, and um, I, I have to say that we were all very surprised on how you managed to wind a very interesting text, but with a very complex and multi-threat analysis of what's going on in the field. So thanks a lot for the text. Yeah, no. We really appreciate it. We just translated it into Spanish because we're going to bring it to the community next month. So we're going to read it out loud for the people who don't read there. But we just finished the translation actually two hours ago into the Spanish. So thanks a lot. And again, can I just, I just wanted to add one last thing is um, the Amazon conservation team is always invited to these communities. We don't, we don't, uh, we never go where we're not invited and we go to places where uh, a lot of people have a difficult time going to. So thank you so much to our team in Colombia uh, for, for doing this and, and you Adam again. Thanks. thanks All right. for having me. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.